Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, how are you all doing? Excited to be out of school for the day? And at a different kind of school, University of Waterloo. Water, Lou, you here for water? Okay, I'll stop. Anyway, but a very warm welcome to you and a good morning. Um, you're here in Federation Hall on uh, the Waterloo campus of the University of Waterloo. And uh, I'm not only w welcoming you here today, but we also have a live broadcast of what it is that we're doing. So we do have people in not just uh, in other parts of Canada, but potentially in other parts of the world who are joining us today. So to all of you, virtual or otherwise, um, a very warm welcome. Uh, it's the TD Walter Bean High School Lecture today, and the title of that is Water Future, A New Generation of Sustainability Leaders. Um, my name is Bruce Brain, and I'm the director of the School of Environment, Enterprise, and Development. You can imagine sustainability is in that, and the acronym for uh, that school is SEED. And uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today and to be part of the, the proceedings. And although I work in sustainability and water is part of that, I always learn something, and particularly as we have such uh, kind of global leaders actually uh, with us today who are going to be sharing with you, so that's exciting. Um, before we go on, though, I'd like to just take a minute uh, for us to reflect a little bit about where we actually are, because we're actually on uh, the traditional lands of uh, of uh, the Six Nations of the Grand River. And uh, that traditional territory is of the neutral Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee peoples. And it's, a, it's important to realize that the sort of standard of living that we have and the kinds of opportunities for education that we have at this university, not only here but on our other campuses, uh, is really being had, if you like, uh, or tied to policies of expulsion, assimilation, and abuse of indigenous people. And so we have a responsibility to acknowledge with respect and understanding the diverse histories and cultures of all indigenous peoples of this country. And I encourage those of you who are joining us online to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you may be on at this present time. Okay. This particular event is made possible because of the 40-year relationship we have with TD and the University of Waterloo. We've partnered together to invest in our sustainable future, and it's because of this partnership that we can host events and have discussions such as these today, which will hopefully pique your curiosity and make you interested in being part of finding pathways to a sustainable future. So I now have the task of changing the slide. There we are. Oh, all right. I guess I should have changed that earlier. Let's do the next one. All right. So we have the TD Walter Bean Professorship in Environment. And so, of course, some of you are probably wondering what that really means. It was founded in 1992 by the late Walter Bean, uh, who was a very engaged community leader in the Waterloo region and who was president of Waterloo Trust until his merger with Canada Trust in 1968. Yep. Since 1994, the, prof the professorship has promoted hands-on learning with a focus on youth, community, education, and environment. And today, TD's The Ready Commitment further aligns our mutual global goal of building a more inclusive and sustainable future through partnerships. And we are proud to count TD as one of our most important corporate partners and philo philanthropic supporters. So thank you very much to TD for their ongoing support. You know, thinking about today's theme, uh, which is water and how it connects to development and sustainability, I just wanted you to reflect for a moment on how important water is uh, to life. It's the absolute central piece of life. And you know, if you think about all of the effort that's put into trying to find life in, on other planets, not only in our solar system, but in our galaxy. What is it that scientists are looking for? They're looking for signs of water, because water is the key to life. 
And so what we're going to have today is a discussion about different elements to do with water and therefore to do with life. And these connect into the global challenges that we have around poverty, gender inequality, disparities in this country, for example, between uh, the wealthy and, and the not so wealthy, between settlers and between First Nations. So there are significant challenges that face us and water holds us all together as the kind of uh, the anchor of life, uh, not just in Canada, but globally. So I think I'm going to um, hand over at this point to Sarah Birch. Uh, she's our moderator today. And Sarah holds a Canada Research Chair in Sustainability, Governance and Innovation, and is an Associate Professor in our Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. As the Executive Director of the Interdisciplinary Centre on Climate Change, she is an expert in transformative responses to climate change and to developing innovative strategies for making progress on sustainability. So thank you all, and I say a warm welcome. Enjoy the day, and I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the session. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you today, and I'm thrilled to have the responsibility of introducing and our brilliant leaders and speakers today and moderating our discussion after their talks. Um, before I jump to the introductions, however, um, I'd just like to encourage our virtual audience to let us know uh, where they're joining us from and send your questions to the YouTube chat. We look forward to answering some of those, uh, as many of them as we can in the, the question and answer period at the end of today. Uh, so I'm delighted now to introduce uh, our esteemed speakers. Uh, Amber Wutich, I'm going to press the right button. Yeah, there we go. Amber Wutich is the President's Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Center for Global Health at Arizona State University. Her two decades of community based fieldwork are concerned with how equitable and unjust resource institutions impact people's well being, especially under conditions of poverty, and how we can fix it. An expert on water security, insecurity, and mental health, she directs the Global Ethnohydrology Study, a cross-cultural study of water knowledge and management in 22 countries. Professor Wudic maintains long-standing ties in her field sites in Paraguay and Bolivia, and manages a global set of strategic global health alliances for Arizona State University. As an ethnographer and methodologist, Professor Rudich has published four books and over 100 articles, which is an incredible accomplishment, and edits the journal Field Methods. Her teaching has been recognized with awards such as Carnegie Case Arizona Professor of the Year. Rudich has raised over $38 million in research funds as parts of collaborative research teams from the US National Science Foundation and other funders. Amber, I am delighted you could join us today as the 2021 T.D. Walter Bean Professor in the Environment. Hi, everyone. I am so honored to be here today as the TD Walter Bean Professor. As you now know, I'm an anthropologist. And when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up to be like Indiana Jones, not the part where he steals antiquities from the rightful ancestral owners, um, but rather the part where he uses human history and cross-cultural knowledge to understand what it means to be human. I like puzzles, and I wanted to help people, so I decided to work on one of the very hardest problems humans have, water scarcity. You might know that you can survive how many days without water? Three, that's right, three days. So what that means is that every single human living now or that ever lived figured out how to solve that puzzle of getting water. We evolved over 200,000 years to accumulate this cultural knowledge. We learned how to harvest water from gourds and dig into the base flow of rivers to excavate water. But the two best ways humans have are migration, meaning moving to the water, and no ownership, meaning not putting boundaries on who gets to access the water. 
And the way we, ar we arrange societies today mostly makes these coping strategies useless. We've only lived in these kinds of state societies for about 6,000 years, so that's only 3% of our history as a species. And we've had water privatization and limits on migration for only a tiny fraction of that. So understanding how humans can survive in the strange ways we live today as we manage climate change in super complex societies is a big puzzle for anthropologists like me. Now I'm going to use the clicker. Yes. So I wanted to work in the places in the world with the most severe water ins insecurity. And that does not necessarily mean deserts or desolate places. It's often in cities where the water systems are set up to exclude people. The image you see here is a warning from the government of Cape Town in South Africa in 2018. People believed at that time that the city of four million people would completely run out of water. Can you imagine if that happens in Waterloo today? It's unimaginable, right? And many people around the world felt that it was impossible to imagine. It sent shock waves through communities and the media around the world. But actually, running out of water is a daily reality for people in cities around the world. It's just not something we hear about a lot. So this map shows you, in dark red, places where there isn't enough water to support the population. Things are looking very good in Canada. Congratulations, Canadians. Um, but if you look down at the bottom of Africa, in South Africa, where Cape Town is located, you can see it's bright red. If you're able to find on the map Arizona, where I have my academic appointment, just north of Mexico, it's also bright red. Got to tell you guys, I did not game out that being a water scarcity expert would mean I always had to live in deeply troubled water scarce places for the rest of my life, but here I am. Uh, the place I want to talk to you today about is in the very heart of South America, in Bolivia. I spent 20 years studying in a city called Cochabamba, Bolivia. It's very famous for a water war. And here you can see a picture of massive protests over water. Who here speaks Spanish? Perfecto, I know you do. Yeah, what does that sign say? It says the water is ours and then a really bad curse word, which I'm going to translate as dang it. The water is ours, dang it. The water war was over water privatization and there were protests with tens of thousands of people and street fights with police. At the time, in the year 2000, the whole world cheered on the people fighting against a big international corporation that wanted to privatize their water. People saw this basically as a problem of businesses in rich countries exploiting people in the poorest countries. And the people you see fighting here won. It was a very inspiring event. Um, there was even a famous movie called And Even the Rain made about it, and it was called that because they even wanted to privatize and charge people for the rainwater they caught. This case shows one of the big dynamics driving global water insecurity, inequalities between rich and poor countries. But now let's talk about another big dynamic, inequalities within countries, because after the people of Cochabamba won the water war, they still didn't get water equality within their society. So I myself took these two pictures from the foot of the world's second tallest statue of Jesus. And looking out as I did over the landscape in Cochabamba, Bolivia, you can see the downtown is filled with high rises and gardens. And on the right hand side, you see the picture I took of low income and water poor communities. It's day zero there every day for people living in the mud houses that, you, that are photographed. People living in these informal settlements are locked into water scarce land and they're locked out of those essential human coping strategies we talked about migration and open water access because they're limited in how they move and they're unable to access water rights. So as an anthropologist, my mission was to understand how people survive there. So remember, anybody who doesn't have water for more than three days is dead. So I knew that there were secrets of human survival to be revealed here. 
In the picture you see, I am just a few years older than you are now. I went to live in Bolivia, an informal settlement, for a year and a half. My goal was to learn how to live on 10 liters or one bucket of water a day. So the bucket you see in the picture is all the water I got every day. I had to relearn everything, how to cook, how to wash, how to use the bathroom, but I did. I also learned how pirate water vendors work. These are basically black markets for water that people use to survive in these informal settlements. When someone like these truckers owns the water, that means people in these communities are desperate to buy from them. And I too learned how to run down the street and beg pirate water vendors to sell me water. This might seem like a foreign or far away problem, but the photo you see is basically of the same system that's operating right now in Texas, near my home on the US-Mexico border. It's day zero in the US, too, for poor communities with water rights. The team I worked with in Bolivia also uncovered water sharing as the most important way that people survive. When we run out of water, the last best way of survival that people have is our neighbors and our friends and our family. And we see this in disasters all around the world. Water sharing with our social networks is a matter of life and death. And as an anthropologist, I know that humans have always survived by depending on each other for gifts and exchanges and help. Working with professors at the University of Waterloo, I'm trying to predict how humans will survive in a future facing climate change and water scarcity. For the poorest and most vulnerable among us, we predict a future with water pipes that are melting and collapsing due to climate stressors and disasters a future with people fleeing into places without water service, and population growth beyond what current infrastructure can handle. That means we need all hands on deck to figure out how humanity can respond to these unprecedented challenges. As an anthropologist, I know we need to re-examine and perhaps even return to coping strategies that have forever enabled humans to survive. Reciprocity, interdependence, stewardship. But there are many puzzles yet to be solved. I'm passionate about working with students from all over the world because students bring their own unique cultural knowledge, perspectives, and skills to these very difficult and complex puzzles. Isabel Jorgensen, who you'll hear from next, will give a glimpse of how students bring their own amazing perspectives and experiences to water challenges. We know in the future that we will experience enormous disruption, but we also have an unparalleled opportunity to reimagine and redesign our societies in better ways than they're functioning now. As a professor, I look forward to working with students like you as we learn to bring your innovation and insight into leading humanity into the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amber. And the, your last point there sort of hit home for me. Um, as a person who works on climate change day in and day out, I often find that that aspect of thinking about the future that we're pulling towards, not just what we're trying to leave behind or move away from, I think is a really important part of the puzzle we're trying to solve at the intersection of climate change and water. Thanks for that. All right, next up, I'm thrilled to introduce Isabel Jorgensen who is a PhD candidate in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability here at the University of Waterloo. She comes from Southern California, but has been living abroad for the last six years in Ireland, the UK, and now Canada. Her research mainly explores competition for shared water resources and how conflict and cooperation can yield sustainable and equitable outcomes for the environment and society. More specifically, she looks at how systemic transitions impact terminal saline lakes and the consequent systemic responses. Beyond researching the environment, she enjoys helping the environment and her community by volunteering and working in student environmental groups. Isabel, the floor is yours.
As we all know, water is essential to life, but many of us in this room will also think fondly of times that we spent just having fun at lakes, rivers, or other water bodies, a use that's not essential to life, but is very important for enjoying it. My research at the University of Waterloo looks at the value of lakes for more than just their essential use, but also how they might build memories, communities, and entire cultures. How many of you have had fun at a lake or a river or any body of water you can put a hand up? Yeah, pretty much everybody in this room, I imagine. Some Canadians enjoy this kind of outdoor aquatic activity by visiting cottages. It's so well known in Canada that it's led to a term called cottage culture, and it's been around since the late 1800s as a way to escape busy cities and enjoy nature. However, cottage culture completely pivots around being able to use a lake. As these cottages are passed down from generation to generation and the stories with them, what would happen if these lakes weren't pretty enough to look at or safe enough to swim in or fish from? It might seem far-fetched, but my research looks at a case where it's actually happened. Lakes can become unusable for a variety of reasons, including blue-green algae blooms, fish kills from lack of oxygen. Some of you might be familiar. Some of you might be familiar with these issues already, and most of you who are probably think of them as something temporary. Maybe you can't swim for a few days, maybe a season, but usually the lakes recover from them. However, that's not always the case. That's not. <laughs> okay, I'll just go without it. Um, although we're in Waterloo now, I'm originally from Southern California, and so are my parents, and we all spent our time vacationing near a giant lake in the middle of the desert called the Salton Sea. My dad used to spend times there with his father, fishing, swimming, and boating in the late 60s and the early 70s, and would tell me stories about fun family memories going on vacation here. But that would be unimaginable today. I doubt any of you in this room would want to swim in this water, and I'm hoping not. Um, however, one second. Yeah. However, this image can show just how serious the consequences of not valuing our lakes for more than just essential uses can lead to. Very few know about the Salton Sea today, actually, even within the state. And I want to look at some reasons why that's happened and also the story behind it, which is also lesser known. But it's very interesting. In the 1890s, settlers went into this desert and they discovered an ancient dry lake bed. However, they realized that the soils would be perfect for farming. The only problem, there was no water. So as Amber mentioned, people always find a way to get this water, and they actually used infrastructure to do this. They went to the Colorado River and built a massive canal that rerouted water all the way west and back into the basin for use on their farms. However, in 1905, the gate that was regulating the flow of the river into that canal broke, and for 16 months, the entirety of the Colorado River spilled into this basin, refilling the lake and bringing it back to life. And even when the gate was fixed, the lake continued to fill as more and more water was used for agriculture and ran off into the lake. And this, this water volume only got larger as more farms came into the area, especially during the 30s and 40s, when the Dust Bowl forced people from the Midwest out west to California to farm. By the 1950s, the lake was so large that marine fish were introduced for sport fishing and yacht clubs began springing up around the lake. But people started to get a little bit worried about the amount of pesticides and fertilizers that might be in this water, especially because of all of the irrigation water that was pouring into it. Those concerns, combined with two tropical storms in 1976, which destroyed the tourism industry, meant that the yacht clubs were abandoned, and by 2003, seeing no value in maintaining this lake, the state transferred the water away from farmers and to the city of San Diego nearby. Now the lake is drying up as a result, and as the lake levels drop, more and more shoreline is exposed, creating massive dust storms and posing a threat to the communities and ecosystems that are there. So why does this all matter? Well, firstly, the public health issue is immense. With all of the dust being kicked up along these lake lines, lake shorelines, it is estimated that by 2047, the state will spend $37 billion treating respiratory-related illnesses. And to give just 
one, one statistic and one example of how bad this problem is, childhood asthma is 37% higher in this region than the rest of the state combined. Secondly, the, the Salton Sea is an important support system for ecological diversity in the state, which has lost 97% of its wetlands. The lake is the largest lake in, in California by surface area and provides important habitat for thousands and up to millions of migratory birds and local endangered species as well. Third, although the cultural value, which I've hinted at earlier, is immense and immeasurable in pure economic terms, to put one small price tag on it, the tourism revenue every single year generates $50 million, even, if, even in its present degraded state. So you can only imagine how much larger that would be if the sea was actually restored. And fourth, the economic value for agriculture is huge at $2 billion per year, and it provides food for both people locally and across the continent, probably even up here in Waterloo. And finally, the lake has sentimental value for me and my family. The picture behind me is my dad with my two little sisters just this past January at the Salton Sea. It's a place that I would never want them to swim or really play in, and it's a place that my dad has fond experiences at but can never really share with them properly because the sea is so destroyed. It's just one example of the kind of loss that's happened in just one small generation. Inspired by my dad's memories at the Salton Sea, I research how these desert lakes scattered across Western North America are being lost forever. That plays. I left California um, in 2015 during the height of the California drought when the Salton Sea's future was incredibly uncertain. It's not gonna play. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in Dublin, Ireland, and when I arrived there, I realized that Dublin was notorious for leaky pipes and reservoirs, and just 10 days without rain meant water scarcity and drought rationing was declared. I learned that water scarcity isn't just a natural symptom of where you live, but also a feature of poor management that can happen in even the most water abundant places like Ireland or Canada. I also learned that one of the cures for it could be good water management, and I learned of all the good being done by locals at the Salton Sea to save their communities and their ecosystems. And wanting to learn more, I went to the University of Oxford in 2019 to study my degree in water science policy and management. I then came to Waterloo just this past year to study my PhD, looking at how and why these lakes are collapsing and what we can do to save them. But education isn't the only type of action you can take. Grassroots initiatives are also an important piece of this puzzle. In fact, in 2019, the only restoration projects that were actually operational at the Salton Sea were grassroots initiatives who used people power to win local, state, and federal grants to build four wetlands that specifically were designed to clean surface water and were actually the first in the US designed to do that. Wetlands work by slowing the flow of water, allowing contaminants and sediments to filter out and settle to the bottom soils. The result is clean, slow-flowing water that's safe for fish to spawn in and birds to go eat. Additionally, the clean water at the end goes back into the water system for use, essentially working like the kidneys in our bodies to clean water. And as important as these systems are, alone they cannot drive the kind of system-wide change that we need. However, they can inspire action at a more systemic level. And we're starting to see large firms like Online Planning, which is directed by Rick Abelson, quoted behind me, starting to look at the solutions to these problems rather than just the problem itself, turning away from this idea of a $70 billion problem and instead looking at a $6.5 billion solution. What is this $6.5 billion solution and how did it come to be? Well, a managing director at the exact same firm and also a local resident uh, near the Salton Sea points to the treated wastewater being discharged to the Pacific Ocean as a potential solution. Pictured behind me is the San Onofre nuclear power plant. It was decommissioned in 2012 and is located near San Diego. It's basically unused infrastructure that has been sitting there for 10 years. What they propose to do is use this infrastructure to reroute treated wastewater away from the ocean and instead to the Salton Sea, refilling it, because it's ultimately a problem of water scarcity. So once you get more water in there, the hope is that it will essentially be recovered. Although it might sound complex, with research, technology, and compassionate people who actually take action, it could become a reality. And complex creative solutions are what we need to tackle the challenges facing our lakes and water issues more generally. In Canada, we tend to take water for granted, especially clean, fresh water. But that won't always be the case, and it hasn't always been the case. Has anyone here ever been to either Lake Winnipeg or a lake that's experienced this kind of pollution? Show of hands. Yeah. 
This is a blue-green algal bloom, and it's in Canada's sickest lake and the world's 10th largest lake. If something like this can happen even episodically to a lake in Canada, a huge freshwater lake, imagine what would happen in the future amongst water scarcity and climate change. This issue is severe and serious, and the water is unusable when this happens. And this image casts a startling glimpse into what the future could be if we're not taking pro proactive and preventative action to ensure that the futures of the desert lakes don't become the futures of the freshwater lakes here in Canada. So what can you do? Firstly, you can treat lakes with respect and awareness. Thinking about what you're putting into them, how much water you're using, and when you visit them, ensuring that you're treating them with awareness, essentially. Secondly, you can join a local activism or a citizen science group. There's many in the local area as well as in the local areas around other lakes that you might visit or know about, and I would strongly encourage you to get engaged with them. And thirdly, you can educate yourself and share your knowledge with other people learning about the importance of water and integrating it into whatever you learn in the future and thinking about water as part of a larger sustainable economic model. <clears throat> so the question really that I have for all of you is what will you do to ensure that these futures don't happen to the lakes near you? Thanks so much, Isabel. I always um, am hungry for a story that brings us to solutions. I really appreciate uh, new ideas. And wherever there's a solution that gives us multiple things that we want at the same time, I get really excited. And so the wetlands story to me sort of hits home as a climate change solution because all of those green and growing things sink carbon and you know they also purify water and enhance biodiversity and lots of good things all at the same time. So um, I really appreciate that, that uh, directing us towards solutions. Thanks. Next up, I'm thrilled and honored uh, to introduce Dax Da Silva. He is the founder and CEO of tech company Lightspeed and the founder of Age of Union. Powering the businesses that are the backbone of the global economy, Lightspeed's one-stop commerce platform helps merchants innovate to simplify, scale, and provide exceptional customer experiences, serving retail, hospitality, and golf businesses in over 100 countries. With Age of Union, De Silva brings leadership, spirituality, and environmental guardianship together to ignite the impactful change makers that the world needs now. This mission comes to life through an alliance for the protection of the world's threatened species and ecosystems. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Dax. You can join us up front. Well, it's great to talk to everybody. Thank you, and, and uh, it's great to be here at the University of, of Waterloo. I'm gonna play a little video. The threat to our planet isn't a lack of awareness, it's a lack of union. As our relationship with Earth evolves, as we become more in tune with how our actions impact others and our surroundings, we believe acts of union, both big and small, when acted on together, have the power to transform our world for good. Because we recognize, no one can do it alone. Age of Union, unearthing change makers. Yeah, I'm here to talk a little bit about igniting change makers and what being a change maker means um, in this really critical decade of action. So I really think that we have like 10 years to really turn around the narrative uh, on the planet, and I'm going to show you some of the early projects that we've done with Age of Union. Um, like, there's about 10 projects in all the different continents of the planet, uh, and also waterways. We're going to talk about uh, rivers and also the oceans. I'm going to talk about the first three projects uh, that, uh, that we've been working on, and hopefully inspire everybody to see how 
to see how actually everyday regular people are, are making day-to-day -day action and change uh, and how that will add up to a big, basically a paradigm shift where if the people care, government will care, corporations will care, and we'll see the, the larger change and change that narrative in this, in this really, really critical decade. I think it's super important. So part of the uh, mission of Age of Union is to align with the UN goal uh, that's called 30 by 30. It's protecting 30% 30 of, uh, of, of the nature that we have remaining and 30% of our, of our waterways and marine areas by the year 2030. It's really important that we make sure that we do protect these areas for wildlife, for our own human health, uh, and for like, and, and it is the front line fight against climate change. If we can conserve these areas that are the, the, the most biodiverse areas, the, the, the richest carbon sinks, then we have a real fighting chance um, to, make, uh, to make material change toward clim towards climate change. Also, when you save an area, when you save, and I'm gonna show you the Amazon, I'm gonna show you a couple different places where we're working, when you save these areas, um, we can actually see, see things happen. You know, climate change is this big, abstract, and very scary uh, thing that we have looming in front of us, and sometimes uh, it's hard to figure out what you can do, but when you see on-the-ground conservation being some of the most effective ways to, to fight climate change, it actually feels like quarter by quarter, month by month, day by day, we can actually do something about it. So where did this, all, why did I even get into this? How did this all start? Of course, I'm, uh, um, Sarah mentioned I'm a tech leader, but I've, I've been involved with conservation and, and, in, and it was an environmental protester uh, since I was 17. So I grew up in BC, uh, I live in Montreal today, but, uh, and I started my tech company in Montreal, but I lived in BC uh, since I was, yeah, since I was born. Um, but BC is like, you know, just grew, I grew up uh, surrounded by nature, surrounded uh, by uh, doing things like camping. My parents are immigrants from Africa, and we really just took advantage of just the beautiful outdoor nature in, in BC. When I was 17, they started to, to log the old growth forests in Clackwood Sound. So this is the west coast of Vancouver Island. Thousand year old trees just being, just being cut for, for kilometers and kilometers. And when we went to, Oh, this is a picture of baby Dax, 140-pound uh, version. Um, and this is the, the little Mustang that I took all the way to Clockwood Sound. This is, a, you can see it's all covered in dust coming back from the forest. So literally driving kilometers across, uh, across Vancouver Island, uh, it was moonscapes, just clear-cut dead trees, destroyed ecosystems, animals with no homes for miles and miles and miles. And finally, when we got to Clockwood Sound, we saw we were protecting the last stand of these thousand-year-old trees, and, and through the protests, and through a direct action, and through challenging the government, we were able to save Clackwood Sound. And so all of us can go down to Tofino and Euclid and all of these areas, um, and, and, uh, and we can see, and, and actually as I've gone back later in life, I think with perspective, you realize how important those places were and how much was destroyed before. Uh, and so that really set me on this journey of like seeing how direct action and, 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 and protesting and, and raising your voice uh, and showing up can really make a huge difference. So that's where, that's where we come to Age of Union. First project that we did with Age of Union is a project called Jungle Keepers uh, in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, and it's, you often hear in the media these stories of the Amazon burning and gold mining and all the kinds of negative things that seem very hopeless and very too big to tackle. But Paul Rosalie, uh, you know, kid from New York that just grew up dreaming about the Amazon, and Dina Tsulahas, a, a yoga teacher from Montreal, and two Peruvians, JJ and Roy, um, they were like, we're not gonna let this forest go down without a fight. Uh, and so they started Jungle Keepers just a dozen years ago. And what they've been able to do, and we've gotten involved in the last couple of years, is they've protected 50,000 acres of the Peruvian Amazon uh, along the Las Piedras River. That's 200 square kilometers. This is a cliff um, that Paul, Paul and Dina took me up to, where for kilometers and kilometers we can now see protected areas. Um, and it's not just enough to protect these areas, you've got to create jobs, you've got to create opportunities for, um, you know, for people. And so now there's a ranger program, so the sons and daughters of, uh, of the illegal loggers, um, and by the way, those illegal loggers, this was the worst job ever, they have broken bodies, and some of them are now helping with this too, 
um, the sons and daughters of these, of these loggers and poachers are now rangers. So they're, they're, they're watching the area for legal poaching, for legal logging, um, and, they're, and now they aspire to be a jungle keeper's ranger, uh, and there's opportunities in, uh, for, for protecting the forest that everybody lives off, and, 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 uh, and there's now a future for this forest. And our goal is to get to all the way to, to expand the jungle keeper's range by six times, to get all the way to the uh, national parks and all the way up to the uncontacted tribes. And what seemed impossible to protect something in the Amazon is very possible because of ordinary, everyday people that just said, we're going to do it. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, going down this river, going down this river, um, you know, we were going for miles down this, this river. And finally, when we got to the age of the part that we started to protect with, with um, jungle keepers, I saw one of the most amazing uh, uh, things that, that, that I saw during the trip, which is like four macaws come flying out of the forest just as we got to the Age of Union part of the reserve, streaking across the sky like pterodactyls, massive macaws. Um, and, uh, and that was just a symbol, a, a signal to me, just like keep going, what these people are doing, what these individuals are, have done. Everybody, if everybody did this, if we had 8 billion change makers instead of 8 billion individualists, we can save the Amazon, we can save anything. Um, <laughs> the next project is right in our own backyard, the St. Lawrence River, and Isabel was talking about waterways and wetlands and how important they are. Um, and I can see the St. Lawrence River from my house. It's like a five minute walk from light speed. And the St. Lawrence River is so ignored, it's just this, we are 70% water. Um, and you know, being from BC, I'm so used to all this, this, this beautiful mountain water coming from the, from, the, from, the runoff of the river, from the runoff of the mountains. And in, in, uh, in Montreal and a lot of Quebec and, and, and uh, Ontario towns, our water comes from the deepest, purest depths of the St. Lawrence River. So we are the St. Lawrence River. We are 70% this river. Um, and we have, for a long time, we, we are, we've just thought about this river as a highway for ships. Um, as something that's completely ignored. Um, but over time, the river has had positive legislation um, come into effect so that big companies and industry have had to clean up their act re regarding the river and, and the pollution. But what we're doing is there's been a lot of degradation of the riverbanks and the wetlands, the natural, that natural filter. And actually, we use the same term, the kidney of the St. Lawrence is this floodplain that's literally one hour from Montreal, and it looks like literally looks like the Florida Everglades. It's an amazing wilderness. And this is an area that, uh, as the snow melts, all of the little islands in this floodplain just completely disappear. And you can see the watermark on these silver maple trees. And in the tops of those maple trees are the great heron nests. So all of these herons live, this is literally, it lives, live in the treetops. This is literally an hour from Montreal. Um, so we have this nature. You don't have to go to the Amazon. It's in our backyard. And the reason why this is important is because all that water that comes through uh, Ontario and Quebec and through the city of Montreal, it comes through this filter. And what we're doing is we're buying back all the farmland and, and revegetating it so that fish can lay eggs, so that, uh, that birds can nest, and so that there's a really great filter. Because where does the water go next? It goes to the whales. There's whales in the St. Lawrence River. And you may not know this, but there's beluga whales, dolphins, but there's also fin whales. There's um, there's uh, gray whales and there's actually blue whales. So some of the most massive whales in, in, uh, in the world are come into uh, the Gulf of the St. Lawrence River. And so we want the purest water uh, coming through our filter, through that kidney. Uh, and I think that's our obligation as, as people, that, as, as societies that use the river, that animals have, that, that our wildlife, our precious wildlife and our precious whales have the cleanest water. Uh, and so this is going really well, and it's, this, isn't a, this is the point here, is that in, in Western countries, um, we may not be able to preserve a pristine, well, there's lots of pristine old growth and, and uh, uh, forest that we need to protect, but in a situation like this, this is the decade also of restoration. We can restore areas, and if you give nature space, if you give na nature a chance, it comes back very, very quickly. So we need to give nature those opportunities to regenerate for, the health, for our own health and for the health of all these animals. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of our latest projects. This is, um, I, who's heard of Sea Shepherd here? 
a few people. Um, they were, they, there's lots of movies made about Sea Shepherd. There's a recent one called Sea Spiracy about, about seafood, which we should really be calling sea life. Um, but Age of Union just sponsored a, a little bit of a battleship uh, with Sea Shepherd. Uh, I was on this ship uh, in March. Uh, and the reason, I'll tell you about why the ship exists, but uh, they've got a fleet of about 14 ships. And uh, one individual, Paul Watson, 50 years ago, was watching the near extinction of whales. And we've been whaling for about 400 years. Uh, and we, it's almost inconscionable to understand that whales were being killed for fuel. Their, bl their blubber was used to light, um, to light lamps uh, and to fuel our industry. Can you imagine our, uh, these intelligent, um, complex uh, creatures were, were hunted to extinct, near extinction for fuel? And Paul Watson said, not on my, not on my watch. I'm not going to let this happen. And because of one person and all of the crews that he built with Sea Shepherd, 50 years later, we have whales coming back in record numbers. We have, yeah, humpback whales. We had a gathering. There was a gathering of 1,000 fin whales, the second largest whale in the Southern Ocean this last year. Um, because you give, you give um, animals a chance, you give nature a chance, uh, it will resurge, and I think that that's like that's why we should never lose hope. We should always, always be like a Paul Watson, be like a Dina, be like a a, a, a Paul Rosalie, and and find ways that uh, that we can that we can ally with nature. So what this ship is, since they've really basically won the whale wars, there's, it's an amazing series if you can watch it called Whale Wars. What it really took, they were. They, would, they were not afraid to put their, put, put their boats in the middle of a Japanese or Icelandic or Norwegian ship and just interrupt the whale hunt. Uh, and they put their lives at risk, uh, and they put everything on the line to save these species, and they did it. Now what they're doing is the, there is in, in crazy overfishing happening on our seas. There's illegal trawlers that, that, uh, that, that take kilometers of nets and pull everything out of the sea. And what's happening is... They're, they're pulling dolphins out of the sea, they're pulling manta rays, sharks, um, turtles, and the Age of Union ship is now on the coast of, was recently on the coast of France, we did a short film on it, um, and the French people, the French government are not even aware there are dolphins, let alone know that there are 10,000 dolphins being pulled out of the ocean and washing up on the beaches. And because of one woman, Lamia, who's the head of Sea Shepherd France, she said, I'm not letting this happen. She's like, we're going to show, we're going to take these dolphins that are dying, we're going to put them in front of the Eiffel Tower, we're going to put them in front of the Parliament, and we're going to let, we're going to educate people that this is happening on their beaches and on, on, their, on their sea. Uh, and so now, it's all over the news. Uh, people in France are, are not standing for it, and that's because one woman's determination, uh, she's a protege of Paul Watson, uh, and actually we're all protégés of Paul Watson in his direct action method, but because of that, we're not gonna let, we're not gonna let this happen. Uh, and you know, right after, right after, right after doing that, and the, and the film's gonna come out in the fall, uh, we went down to the Red Sea, where the Egyptian government's doing an amazing job of, of dolp dolphin habitat, the Sataya Reef. We were able to dive and take uh, film of three or four hundred wild dolphins that come into an area and basically sleep and play and go, go nuts. So, you know, when we have areas that are protected, like I said, we want to protect 30% of the planet by, and, and waters by, by 2030. This is, uh, this, is the, this is the future. We want all these species to be thriving alongside of us in healthy environments. So every daily act can be an act of conservation. You know, for sure, if, you, if you're interested in, in helping with these causes, there's so many causes um, where you can get involved. Sea Shepherd does beach cleanups uh, in almost every community. Um, you can get involved with, uh, you know, with uh, things like Nature Conservancy on your local waterways or, uh, you know, or get involved with Jungle Keepers or, or any of the conservation groups. They, they need people. But you can also think about the things that we do every single day on autopilot. We make many decisions during our day. Um, you know, 
Every time we choose to have a meal, can we have more of a plant-based meal sometimes? Can we, uh, how are we transporting ourselves um, around, uh, you know, around the city, around the town? You know, can we choose more uh, things that are better for the environment? Um, what are we consuming? Can we use reusable containers? Can we do something that's, uh, that's more sustainable? So all of those actions are, are things that, we, that make us more closer to union. Union with nature, union with the planet. We need to come together for nature. And as you can see, regular, ordinary people can actually change the whole script. They can change the narrative. Uh, and so hopefully all of you uh, can get a little bit of inspiration from these amazing folks uh, and do, we can all do our part to be 8 billion change makers and not 8 billion individuals. You all ready? Yeah? OK. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for that. Oh, am I on? OK, here we go. Thanks so much for that, Dax. I really appreciate the direct action lens and the connection to nature. It was really beautiful. Um, I'd like to invite my speakers and panelists up to the front with me, please. And we'll now have a little discussion and question and answer period. So if Amber, Isabel, and Dax could join me up front, that would be fantastic. Can you hear me? Ah, hey, there I am. OK, great. Excellent. Um, OK, thanks, everyone. I really appreciate um, very different angles and approaches and kind of life stories when it comes to how you um, approach these issues of, of water scarcity, security, and nature conservation. Um, I also really appreciated that you told us a little bit about your kind of personal trajectory and sort of what inspired you and how you came to do this work. And I'd like to look ahead to the future, because that's sort of what stuck in my mind, at least, was what vision of the future you have in your mind that you're sort of pushing towards, that you're advocating for through, through your research, through your work, um, through your writing, whatever it is that you do. So if we were to like fast forward 20 or 30 years, not too long, you know, within our lifetimes, but long enough to make some real change, and you saw successes, you got what you wanted, <laughs> what would the future look like to you? What are, we, what are we all collectively pushing towards? That's my question for you. Whoever wants to jump in first can go for it. I, I think one of the things that um, resonated with me when I heard Paul Watson say it is don't concern yourself with what people are saying about the future. What you do in the present creates the future. Because there's a lot of doom and gloom, you know, and obviously, from what I presented, we're not about doom and gloom. We want, we want everybody to understand that the present and the present actions are going to be the future. We fixed the ozone layer collectively. We were able to bring back whales from extinction. Um, that was because people decided in the present that they were not going not to uh, subscribe to whatever prediction there was, you know. So I think that's like, we now can imagine whatever world we want that's, that's more connected to nature, more in harmony of nature, and then work towards that with the things that we're doing in the present. And I think that that's, that future is dictated by yeah. present action. That's great. And it seems like also a focus on telling the stories of the successes is a really important demonstration of what we're collectively capable of. Because we hear a lot about what we're failing at and what we're not moving fast enough mm -hmm. towards. And that's a pretty overwhelming story. I don't know about you, but it's overwhelming for me. Um, so the, the stories of what has worked and what we can replicate and do more of is empowering. Amber? Hi, everybody. So the thing, obviously, from my talk, I'm most focused on human survival. Right? And so my focus is I direct a Center for Global Health. I want as few preventable deaths to happen as possible. I want to stop people from dying. So the great thing about water is that it's one of the easiest ways to achieve that goal. So we've only had public water systems for 100 years. 
making progress in those water systems, some people estimate that we can reduce 50% of global illness and premature death by just making progress on water. So I hope for a world in which more people have stable access to clean water because it solves so much. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think I would, um, I would echo some of the sentiments that um, both Dax and Amber have shared. I think I see water as a very much a kind of a cornerstone to this larger puzzle, and it's often, it's not as um, hot of a topic perhaps as climate change to discuss, but it's absolutely integral to that piece, and we've spoken about a lot today about how essential it is for life and how it leads to so many preventable deaths, um, and I think that that is kind of the main, the main focus of what I do as well with my research is looking at like not just the life and death, but also, you know, what it means to live and be alive and what it means to enjoy that. And, you know, I'm only 24, so it's hard to think about what it will be like in 20 years, but ooh, especially with climate change and everything. But, um, and I think that sometimes, you know, to echo what Dak said, it can be hard to like look that far into the future, especially when you start thinking about the different, you know, uncertainties that are there. And sometimes it's best to just seize that kind of passion and ambition that you have for today and really focus on driving those morals home now and hoping that will work. It's very impossible to imagine, oh, in 20 years I could save an entire whale population from extinction, but by focusing on the present, you can kind of make that happen. And that's what I look at too. And in the Salton Sea, for example, all of those grassroots wetlands projects were pretty much done by um, lo the local Native American tribes combined with the work of um, skilled um, immigrants from Mexico. Um, looking at these people that are really pushing on this brink of survival for things that are worth more than just survival, but also for their quality of life. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point to sort of reflect on what the good life is, what it could look like, um, and what it, what it is now, and how, how we might shift it, you know, through access to nature and, and communion with nature, and that's, and, you know, embracing the stewardship role to... Um, to improved public health and access to clean water and this kind of thing. So there's a, there's a lot of elements there that I think we could cobble together to create a vision that we might push towards. Um, I'll, I'll ask, I have the privilege of asking one more question before I open it all up to you. So prepare yourselves. I really want questions from all of you and from those who are watching online. We'll have mics come to you in a minute if you, if you can stand up and ask a question of our panelists. Um, I think this is true in the, in the domain of, of water as much as it is um, for, for climate change. Um, we hear often that this is like a, a deep systemic problem, right? That it's, it's um, water scarcity or poor water quality and a changing climate are just these enormous challenges that governments need to address that are, you know, that require collective action, certainly at the very least, but um, policy change. And so, while I tend to agree that that's absolutely true, it kind of takes the wind out of our sails as individuals. Like, what is the connection of us as individuals and the actions we take and then these, these big, deeper, deeper shifts? So I, I, I appreciate that you all, in one form or another, had a kind of call to action. But considering who we have in front of us here today, how would you think about the connection of our individual behavior and action to solving these massive, complex, collective challenges? Anyone help me tease that apart? I, uh, yeah, I have an answer for that, um, in my opinion. I think that um, the beauty of a system is that it's all connected. And so ultimately, the levers that change that system are, can be very small, and they can enact much larger change than what that individual action started as. Um, it's not true, the whole raindrop in the ocean thing. It's much more like the butterfly's wings analogy of a butterfly wing can cause a hurricane somewhere else, even though you know, that's been disproven. But I think it's a good analogy for describing the actions of individuals. And in all of the cases I think that we've described, it was just a couple of individuals who started that system change, and they used it as a, as a starting point for something larger. Um, Yeah, I think if the, if the people care and we vote with our dollars, we, we are, we're loud, uh, we make it a priority, we prioritize the environment, we prioritize um, water and, and climate change, then the government will care and the corporations will care. They'll respond to what the people care about the most. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, 
If, if it's number four on the list or five on the list, it's not going to be the top priority for the government. But if it is, there's amazing people in government. They want to do these things, but they'll work on the priority of what is important to people. Yeah. So yeah. we need to, like, this generation needs to make it the top of, we need to, at least for the next 10 years, we need to get a start on making this the very, very top priority. Uh, and so that we get onto a path where we're now aligned to do the right things for, for our natural environment and our biosphere, our life support system, yeah. uh, it can't be number five. Yeah, yeah. You bring to mind, I, um, I, I'm a social scientist, so I often interview politicians and decision makers and such and ask them questions. And I once asked, a, I was talking to a councillor, a city councillor about climate change, and he said, you know, you don't understand. We don't lead as your city councillors. We follow. We take your temperature as our constituents, and mm. we go in the direction that we think you're sending us. I don't know if that's always true, but I think it's an important lens to have on when you think about people who are making decisions on your behalf, that the signals you send them, yeah. um, your individual actions to, to you know, conserve water or to reduce your carbon footprint or whatever are important. But the si signals you're sending through those actions you know, have the potential to tip the scales on the collective action, which is cool. Amber? Hi, I'm going to come from a very different direction. So I do want to acknowledge that policy is the most important way to address these global climate issues. And so direct political action is something everybody can do. Um, I call my legislators, co legislators constantly. So yes, all of that. Um, but as an anthropologist, I sit back and look at 200,000 years of human evolution. And it actually kind of freaks me out that we talk about the last 30 years as if it's something that we want to prolong or or that's really awesome and we're sad that we're losing it, it wasn't good, it wasn't awesome at all. Um, as an anthropologist, the way we're living now is not optimized to increase our happiness. Um, it does not give us the meaning of life. The massively inequitable systems that we're all having to survive in don't make us happy. The way that we Netflix and chill instead of talking to our neighbors does not make us happy. We know that. We know that from studying human history. We know that from studying across cultures. So there is individual action we can do to grow our societies in different ways about how we relate to each other. And it doesn't take any more than turning to the person next to you and be more reciprocal with them and engaging in your environment in a more reciprocal way. And that's the meaning of life. So true. Wow. We got the meaning of life. That's powerful stuff. Honestly, I, uh, I'm sure we've all reflected, you know, through the COVID times, through the lockdowns that, that we've all suffered through and the isolation that, um, you know, that was an interesting moment to reflect on, re reflect on what mattered and the relationships that we weren't able to support or to build, I think, felt like a real loss over the last couple of years for, for many of us. But I myself, I, I live in a cute little neighborhood. I've made friends with neighbors for the first time in my life, and it was our sharing and um, just supporting each other throughout the length of COVID that actually made it somewhat survivable. So I really take that point to heart that it's our, our trust and um, reciprocal relationships with people we love and care about in our community that, um, that has a more powerful effect than individual action, for sure. All right, thanks everyone for uh, allowing me to ask some questions. I'd like to open it up to you all now. You have an opportunity to ask as many questions as you like. Um, you can uh, sort of direct it at the whole group and somebody can jump in or you can direct it at somebody in particular. So who would like to jump in with a question? Somebody will bring a mic to you, whoever would like to ask the first question. Awesome, we have one in the back here, or middle, middle left. Um, what's your name? Kendra. Okay. Oh. See, she, she wants to know, um, is there a plan for the decentralization of your water? That's it, right? Say that again, please. Um, yeah, what's the plan for the decentralization of the ocean water? Sorry, the, the, the audio quality with your mask is a little rough. I can't quite understand. Miriam, do you want to... Oh, okay. What is the plan for the desalinization of the ocean water? Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Okay, plan for desalinization of ocean water. Anyone want to? Resume, that's, is that directed at? Sorry? Was that directed for me, or was that? Get in there. Yeah. Whoever, okay. Whoever can be yeah, for it. Um, they're not desalinizing any ocean water. That's actually the plan that's being struck down. It was, it was a potential solution, but um, it's very criticized because there's desalinization plants, but they're very, um, the brine that they discharge is bad for the environment. They're incredibly expensive. Um, they work in some context, but this is not that context. Um, instead, it'd be using treated wastewater, which is already, um, it's pretty much fresh water. It's slightly contaminated. It's already used in fountains and for gardens around cities. Um, but instead, they're considering sending it to the Salton Sea rather than just discharging it into the ocean. So it's a release into the ocean, not taking any water out of the ocean. Um, and in addition, I wanted to mention that these new technologies that we have for treating wastewater or for desalination um, are being deployed around the world in ways that are very unpredictable, um, and we don't know what's going to happen. So for example, will the water continue to be very expensive? Will it start to get cheap? Will only rich people get to consume it? Will only poor people be forced to consume it? We really don't know. So this, one of the reasons that I came here to University of Waterloo was to have a chance to collaborate with leading scholars um, who are here at this university who can help us predict and get in front of some of these dynamics around desalinization and other um, water quality technologies. Thanks for that. Do we have another question? There we go. Broke the, mm -hmm. broke the seal. Okay. <laughs> Who's up next? OK, so this question is for Dax. And it was about how long would it take to get the whale population back up? Or how long did it take? Yeah, so I think that there's some whales that are doing a lot, a lot better than others in terms of uh, species rebound. The humpback whale has done phenomenally. Phenomenally, you're seeing humpback whales almost in every every uh, large ecosystem. Um, I, I think the fin whale, that gathering of a thousand fin whales in the southern uh, the southern ocean, was a real shock to scientists because they didn't think that those whales were were seeing such a resurgence. Um, I think it's much much faster than. Um, because there's now marine protected areas, and because the whaling has dropped, has been uh, reduced almost almost nothing, um, we've given whales a chance to, to rebound and repopulate. Um, I was just in Trinidad last week, and uh, leatherback turtles. We were doing, uh, you know, watching the, the nesting grounds of leatherback turtles. Thirty years ago, they were being poached and butchered on the beach for their for their meat and their eggs. And now, with just thirty years of of us protecting the mothers, we're seeing that. We're seeing that uh, that population rebound. I don't think it takes too long for 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 wildlife to rebound if you give them the space, you give them the opportunity, and you properly protect their environment, and their habitat. Great, it's good to know. Okay, over here. Yeah. So we have a question over here. Um, he wants to know if you think that we'll ever run out of water, and if so, when would that be? I, I think I need you to speak up. I'm so sorry. he wants to know. Yep. If we'd ever run out of water, and if so, when would that be? Will we run out of water, and if so, yeah, when will that it. be? Yeah. Is that right? OK. Will we run out of water, and if so, when will that be? Yeah, lots of people are already out of water. People run out of water all the time, right? The question is, what sorts of solutions you have? Um, and migration has historically been one of the important solutions, and most people don't have that in the toolkit anymore. So um, yeah, people run out of water all the time. There is another question over here, and the question was, you mentioned seafood to sea life, and she was wondering why the change now, and what can we expect in the future? I think we really have to think about that term seafood. Um, if you think about the, the French version of it, fruit, fruit, fruit de mer, fruit de la mer, uh, it's fruit of the sea. Fish and, and, and sea life, they're not fruit. Like we're, we, we, it's, not, it's not like fishermen are, are, are planting seeds and then pulling a crop. We are hunting uh, on a massive industrialized scale sea life. We cannot think about it as seafood. It's not a commodity. It would be unacceptable to think about anim land animals in, in, in terms of tonnage. But we pull tons and tons of, unsustainably pull tons and tons of sea life out of the ocean. And we make it feel better for ourselves that it's seafood, like it's uh, the fruit of the sea. I think we have to really change our perspective on that. Um, because ocean life, a lot of our oxygen comes from the vitality of ocean life. Uh, and we, we mess with that ecosystem to our own peril. 
Um, we will have empty oceans by 2050. And like I said, the future that they're talking about of, of an empty ocean by 2050 does not have to be that way. Um, we can uh, change our perspective, and I think that if there are two things that we could eat less of, uh, is the beef that, uh, that they were cutting down the Amazon to ranch, and, and seafood, which is, I, I think we should think about it as sea life. Those are the two most destructive um, if you're trying to you know, eat better for the planet. Uh, that's my humble opinion. <laughs> I think it's an interesting reflection, too, on just uh, shifting our view of nature in general yes. from a resource we extract for our economic benefit and to, to nature as it's having its own inherent right to exist, right? And also many more values beyond. Animals are not commodities. Right. Mm -hmm. They are not. Another one from over here? Sure, we can start here. Okay. Uh, they were wondering how or what are the odds of fixing the water scarcity issue and roughly how long it would take to completely solve the problem? Who wants to talk about the odds? <laughs> this is a tricky one. <laughs> The question is, what are the odds? Like, how likely are we to fix it? Yes. Yeah, OK. So let's take a heterogeneity, a heterogeneity look at this. We have very good odds of fixing it for some people in certain places, right? So we have um, a lot of evidence about what kinds of engineered and social infrastructures can fix these problems. Um, so that's really good news. We know how to fix them in most ecologies. Um, the way that our societies are organized right now, we have a very low likelihood of fixing them globally. So DAX has drawn attention to the problem of commodification. We are experiencing problems of the commodification of human labor. So people's own lives are not valued equitably. Uh, we have a commodification of water, so people can't afford it. So we're going to have to do something about how we value um, people and water and how we organize our societies inequitably um, in order to solve this water problem. But if we do those things, and I think that people who are professors like me or Dr. Birch, like our whole life is dedicated to growing the next generation of scholars and actors who completely understand these problems and are perfectly poised to fix them. And when I look at rising generations of 20-something scholars, your generation is so much more on it than we were, right? It, so I think we're actually making progress in that way. Um, and so when I'm like, oh, we're not going to solve it, if we stay in the society we're in right now, yeah, we're not going to solve it. Um, but we have many very good solutions and a lot of hope. Yeah, I would add that I think the way to increase those odds is like starting to recognize water as not just water, but in the many forms that it comes in. The shirt that you wear is made out of probably cotton, which is grown with a lot of water, and the food that you eat is grown with water. And you need to start thinking about water scarcity in those terms as well. Um, and I think that that increases our odds of solving it when it's thought of in that kind of more complex way. I think that lens of inequality is a really, really important one. And we brought that up again and again, just how unequal um, the impacts of climate change are, just how unequal the implications of water scarcity are. And our solutions need to have justice, I think, equity at the, at the core of those solutions. We have another question. We have a whole bunch of questions. You got one? OK. I have a question directed to Professor Amber. Um, she heard that you survived on a bucket of water, wants to know a little bit more of your experience, <laughs> how you did it. Yeah, so the thing with anthropologists is that we have this method called ethnography, and our main measurement or research instrument is our own bodies. So whatever we learn to study, we have to physically learn to do it perfectly. And learning to use water um, in the ways that I described in my lecture what meant epic humiliation at all times. I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know what to drink. Using the bathroom was a total disaster. Uh, you have to learn to hand flush with reused water, very tricky skill. Um, so all humans learn in two ways, trial and error and social learning. And I was lucky enough to have people around me who were patient um, and teach me. And so that, that's something that as humans, we all, we all pay it forward, right? Somebody teaches you, and then you teach them. And so this is um, something that's very exciting and inspiring about being an anthropologist, is that you get to have these adventures and learn to live in new ways. Great. Thank you. I think we have a question from our online participants. Or, or somebody. OK, I, go ahead. I was going to say, I have two questions here. The first one is for Isabel. You mentioned 
contaminated lakes can be restored. And they were wondering, how can these lakes be restored and how can they help as students? Different lakes have different needs. And so that, that answer, I will return back to that <laughs> heterogeneity comment, which is that it's going to be very different in every different context that you have. For most of these lakes, honestly, what they just need is more clean water, um, but water that's clean enough for the functions that they serve. So the lakes that I specifically study are naturally quite salty. Um, it's just part of being in a desert environment and having high rates of evaporation. So they don't need that fresh of water. Um, but the lakes up here, they need more clean water. So their issue is really around water quality and less so the quantity problem. So when we think about what we can do here, just even immediately, we can think of things like runoff, like what are we putting on our lawns to keep it green? What are we putting in our showers? If we go camping, are we using real shampoo? Are we using biodegradable shampoo? What are we using? Um, small things like that add up actually quite a lot, and it's just a little bit of that tainted water that can really mess up those ecosystems. Hosing off boats before putting them in different lakes, those kinds of things are really important for the Canadian context. And the second question is for Amber. Is water rationing something that we will see in common practice in the to Cape Town and their comeback from day zero? I don't know if you caught all that. My mic is Is cutting. water rationing something we'll see in Cape Town and will they come back from day zero? Is that um, the question? Something that we'll see as a common practice, kind of similar to how Cape Town came back. Oh, yes. We'll definitely see water rationing. Um, and we are seeing it all around the world. But when it's well managed, you don't feel the impact very much. So I'll give an example. Where I live currently in Arizona, we have got a severe, severe climate change problem. We have less rainfall every year. In fact, right now, if you were to sort of like Google up the temperature, it's 45 degrees where I live. And people are, you know, they're bracing for people to start dying. And water scarcity is a piece of why you die in very hot climates, right? Um, but in Arizona, by and large, they have very good management. So one thing that they're doing is that they're taking more water from agriculture, um, using less thirsty agriculture, and putting that into cities. So, right, so moving it around through allocation. Another thing they're starting to do is um, the retirement of lawns. So like, let's have these really gorgeous xeriscaped lawns with cool cactuses and beautiful rock formations. And you won't notice that you're not getting your lawn so much, um, but that will save a lot of water. So when you have rationing, um, and it's well managed, then it's not very scary and it's something we can all easily cooperate around. The issue is when it's poorly managed or there's no planning and all of a sudden you turn on your tap and there's nothing there. However, as an anthropologist, we know that humans develop cultural knowledge to manage that as well. So in places where I work, people had their own, even up to 10,000 liter storage containers under their house to manage this kind of rationing. So I guess what I would say is, yeah, we'll definitely expect to see that in many, if not most societies, if we continue on the current course. But there are lots of ways to manage it so that it is not terrifying. Great. Good answer. Thank you. I, we have another question on this side. Yeah. Um, as a high school student, what can we do now to help with water sustainability? As a high school student, what can we do now? That's a good question. Who wants to jump on that? I, mean, I think the absolute um, best thing is help like, map out the problems that exist and start thinking about solutions. I mean, there are a lot of local groups that do activism in citizen science, which is basically where you can walk around a water body and document bird populations and what it looks like. Does it look clear? Does it look cloudy? Like, those little things that might seem like kind of almost like, oh, this is really small. It's just like a fun exercise that my, my teacher is showing me. It's actually really important, and scientists use it all the time. Those small little things are really useful. You can find about them on Facebook or Google. and. The volunteers and organizers of it are usually more than excited to have you reach out to them. Anyone else? I, I yeah. think, and I think Dax also thinks, and I hope you'll say, there is no substitute for political action. Some of yeah. these problems can't be solved for anything other than large scale policy making. And, you know, every single one of us can be a wrench that we throw in the machine that's doing harm. And if we care about these things, that's the totally very agree. first thing we need to do. Yeah. You can also run for office. You can, be, you can actually make some decisions that, that align with your values and be a part of the political system as well. Um, any day, really soon. Um, I think we have one more online question. Is that right? OK, and we're, I, I assume we're near time, but go ahead. All right. Um, is the mic on? Can you hear me? OK, yeah, let's awesome. speak up. Um, this question is for Dax. Um, it's, uh, the student is wondering how he instills his 
um, passion for the environment and, and those values into his company, um, and more specifically, um, how they uh, how you reduce water um, through your business activities. Yeah, so it's. I, I think we're trying to. We're we're, we're still trying to. Um, Build a sustainability and, uh, and, and ESG sort of uh, effort at light speed. We're a software company, so you know we were just discussing this uh, yesterday. How do we um, understand the carbon footprint? Understand the, the 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 impact of our data centers and so on. So I think that because we've bought about 12 companies, we're now integrating them and understanding the global carbon footprint and also uh, the travel that happens between offices and so on. So that, that's that's an area that I have a big uh, a big hand in. Um, and I think that that passion, the passion of what we're doing in Age of Union is actually quite uh, alive at Lightspeed. There's a lot of people that are, really, uh, that are really passionate for doing things for the environment. So we are creating volunteer opportunities for them to you know, get onto the river at the St. Lawrence and see the restoration work happening. Because uh, there are things that are nearby or beach cleanups in nearby neighborhoods uh, that are run by Sea Shepherd. So we're trying to connect all of those dots uh, there's things that the company is doing operationally that, uh, that, that we can improve, and there's also things that we can get out there uh, and, and do and participate in. And, and I think that a company that, would, that has purpose, a company where everybody feels engaged that we're doing something for a bigger reason, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is a company that, uh, that has that, that, that real drive and that real fire uh, to, to make change just beyond what we're doing as a business. It reminds me a little of the story of Patagonia. If you, if you don't know about Patagonia's sustainability right. practices, you should look into it because the employees of Patagonia are actually paid to do direct action, um, volunteering, and political activism uh, on the side. So they, it's part of their like, job to work for Patagonia but also do um, you know, more sort of direct action as well. And, and then the operations of Patagonia are made more deeply sustainable as well. Yeah, we do, we do paid volunteer days and, right, uh, and exactly. there's competitions of who's doing what and, and people are doing groups and, and uh, challenging other groups of people to, cool. to do things that, cause, and everybody's got things that are differently uh, passionate about, but right. the environment is a very big theme. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, unfortunately we have time for one more question. Those of you with your hands up who don't get to ask, we will be here, please come up, feel free to mingle and ask questions. One more from our online audience. This question is for anybody on the panel that would like to answer. Um, and the question is, what are your thoughts on the switch to wooden utensils in fast food restaurants as opposed to plastic? While this reduces ocean plastic pollution, what is the better solution holistically? Okay, so what are your thoughts on the move towards uh, wood utensils over plastic and the different and new problems that might create? Good. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's... <laughs> There's definitely some materials like bamboo uh, that, that's fast growing that could be that could be great alternatives. Um, I, I, I really I really think that uh, that the the reusable uh, you know if, if if there can be metal and, and reusable uh, and that we're not creating new items and creating new waste that we can find ways to efficiently clean and reuse. Um, that's much, much better. And I, I really feel that when we, whenever we do takeout as opposed to going to a restaurant, we also create a lot more waste. You know, even if they're biodegradable, all those containers, you know, why, not, you know, why not go to a place? Why not go to a, a store? Why not visit places and get into our community, put um, dollars into, directly into the hands of people in our community and reduce our waste, uh, in, uh, our waste footprint? Yeah, I would just add at a broader level, it's really important when we think about the lifestyle drivers of climate change that the lowest income 50% of the world is only generating 10% of the impacts. So when we look at where to reduce, we need to keep equity in mind and not focus over much on the behaviors of the poorest um, in the world because they are not making the, the worst impact, frankly. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much to all for answering and asking those questions. I really appreciate them. I'd like to see which questions we um, uh, weren't able to answer. And I'd like to invite uh, Bruce Frain back up to the stage to wrap us up. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I don't really know what to make of this. I was asked to come up and kindly reflect on uh, the discussion that we've had, but it's a, it's a pretty complicated subject, 
And we've heard depressing things today. We've heard very hopeful things. We have seen action, Dax. You've got lots of rounds of applause, so obviously there's a lot of energy, I think, in the room uh, and amongst your generation for actually doing something. Uh, and, you know, you don't, we don't all have to necessarily go to university and become professors in a subject in order to actually make a change in the world. It helps if you have some information, though. So, Faculty of Environment, right here, the oldest in the country, um, is a great place to come and, and actually learn. But there, there are many different ways of, of getting an education of empowering yourselves. Um, and I'll just reflect a little bit on two things which I think are very important. One is that we live in an increasingly uh, unequal world. And I think that that is a fundamental challenge to society. We know from our research that even wealthy societies, perhaps the wealthiest on the planet, like the US, has the greatest inequality and it has some of the greatest social, health, environmental, and political problems. So inequality is one issue. The other is political, and we really do need to get leaders into place. So I'm going to just ask you a question. You know, we tend to think of politicians as old people, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, etc. But actually, Canada is a good example of someone a bit younger. But who is the youngest prime minister in the world? Anyone know? It's the prime minister of Finland. She is 34 years old. All right? So I don't know what your average age is here, but you don't have long to go before you could also be a prime minister. But that takes a population that votes. So we had in this province elections with the lowest voter turnout in history. So part of the problem is apathy. So you have to get out there when you're legally able to and vote because it's that voice that tells government what the priorities are and what they need to do. And we heard that from all of our panelists today. All right. So. I'm going to leave it at that and just give my thanks to our panelists, um, Dax, Amber, and uh, Isabel. Yeah. And they will be here to mingle with you, so, you know, uh, but a special thanks also to Sarah Birch, who is always pulled into these things but does such a great job. Thank you. All right, and I, I'm going to thank our sponsors now, uh, TD, for their very generous support. They have this long-standing commitment, as I said, 40-odd years of partnering with us, um, dealing with youth, sustainability, education, and environment. And so let's have a very loud cheer for them, because that's what makes it possible for us all to be here today. So thank you. <laughs> And lastly, thank you to all of you. So our panel, hi everybody, I'm Miriam. I work uh, with Vesti who has arranged all of this. Can we give Vesti and her team a big round of applause? Awesome. So Vesti is going to announce school names, and we have Ronaldo and Abby in the back who are going to take you to grab your lunch. Then they're going to bring you back, and you're going to sit down either here, upstairs, or come back on your seats. Feel free to move the seats around a little bit if you want to be comfortable. Um, you can take your masks off while you're eating. We're going to take some photos here, and then we're going to leave. But if anybody has any questions for Dax, Amber, and Isabel, or Sarah, or Bruce, um, you can also come up right now, um, and then uh, we will take off, and then you guys can enjoy your lunch, okay? Thank you, everybody.